long, long ago, when there were no people on the earth, a fistful of the first leopards left bountiful African expanses and headed off to take on new lands. The bravest of them penetrated deep into the north, to the crests of the harsh Sikatalian mountain system in the Russian Far East, throwing a direct challenge to Mother Nature. These leopards found a way to survive, to hunt, to raise their kittens in deep snow. The thick fur, brushy tails, and gray eyes of these northern leopards distinguished the Far Eastern leopard from all its southern brothers and sisters. But people arrived to this land conquered by these leopards. And immediately, these people engaged in a merciless battle with a wilderness that they perceived as a threat. And that meant they also waged a battle with the leopards. The leopard has endured heavy losses in this war and has been forced to gradually retreat to the south. During this hundred-year-long unequal battle with people, the leopard's historic range has shrunk by a factor of 40. Leopards are no longer encountered in the Sikhatailin. They have disappeared from their northwestern stronghold near Lake Hanka. People in China have been more successful in their battle with the forest taiga, and thus a leopard simply doesn't exist in that country anymore. The animal's path to its historic homeland is cut off by forestless, uncultivated valleys in which putter millions of farmers. 1972. Vladimir Abramov, Dmitry Pikonov, and Vyacheslav Basilnikov conduct an official count of leopards across their entire range. This was a count conducted in the snow, during which tracks were carefully measured. One result shocked the specialist, 46 individuals, that is, fewer than 50. According to a generally accepted theory of population genetics, a population of fewer than 50 individuals is doomed, for such a small number means that irrevocable processes are associated with inbreeding will ensue. It was a moment when a cross could have silently been placed on the leopard. Government officials recognized that a problem existed, but no one dared to take responsibility for the ill-fated populations. But the leopard appears to have challenged this theory. Three decades have passed. Officials have changed and borders have been adjusted. One international conference has followed another. Specialists grew gray and passed away. Their students moved in and took charge of the research. However, each new snow survey has given one and the same figure, 30 to 40, just a few short of 50. This is inexplicable. This can't be. This fistful of animals is failing to fade away. The leopard shows no plan to vanish from the face of the earth. An alternative survey method, one not dependent on the fine art of tracking, had to be found to get more accurate counts of the leopards. And this is when researchers came up with the idea of using automatic camera traps. The method is relatively simple in theory. The pattern of the spots on each leopard is unique and does not change over time. Like a person identified by criminologists using fingerprints, the leopard is unmistakably distinct with its unique pattern of rosette. So the goal was to place specially designed cameras in the taiga, then wait for the shutter to click. Once you have photographed the number of animals using cameras, that trigger automatically with the passing of a leopard. And after you've accounted for the number of repeat photos, all that's left is to apply formulas to arrive at a number for the leopards in this range. In 2002, the Wildlife Conservation Society in league with the Institute for Sustainable Nature Use began this project. The world awaited impatiently for some results. Everyone wanted to believe that an alternative, modern method would provide more hopeful numbers for leopards. However, the combination of Kodak film and mathematics gave frighteningly familiar figures, 30 to 40 individuals. In studying the data derived from the photographs, researchers realized that camera traps are capable of providing much, much more information than just the total number of leopards. They can tell a story of what is happening within the population. The caveat is that the camera traps must be stationed in one and the same spot year after year. So when the World Wildlife Fund joined forces on the project, researchers gained long-term security to continue to work in the northern and central parts of Leopard Range. Camera traps have been in use for five years, and we can now tell a little something about each of the Far Eastern Leopards living in the area where these cameras have been placed. Save each of the survivors. This animal caused a real sensation. We got to know him in 1994, and that acquaintance was quite intimate. 
We hunted a month for this powerful male so that we could put a collar on him. He deftly skirted our snares, was quick to figure out any ruse. And even when he did get snared, the first immobilizing dart failed to bring him down. Only after the third dose did he submit to allowing us up close. As we measured and weighed him, he attempted to raise his numbed head in a desire to punish his offenders. And when he came out of his haze and was able to get on his feet, he tracked us all the way back to the cabin. The animal was six years old when we collared him. This is the peak of a leopard's prowess. The data from the radio collar showed that Leopold, that's what we called him, had strengths that were almost immeasurable. For over a year and a half, his radio signal called out from the Eldega Cliffs and from the headwaters of the Griazne River and then from somewhere in China. Finally, though, the transmitter went silent. But suddenly, nine years later, one of the camera traps shows a leopard with a collar. Fifteen is a very grandfatherly age for leopards, even ones living in park conditions. And for an animal living in the wild, all the more the very heart of a territory famous for the intensity with which the area is hunted by humans, it was truly sensational to find Leopold alive. Old man Leopold took to being photographed and never skirted a camera. And in this way, we discovered that in the last nine years, his hunting range has remained almost unchanged and was as expansive in 2003 as it had been when we attracted him to find a radio collar. The male Shufansky. We've known him for about four years. When we first met him via a photograph, he was already a strong adult male whose range was enormous, a result of battles won with rivals. His southern range bordered on Leopold's. By all indications, these two long ago had figured out how to live as neighbors, long before we started our camera trap for. Leopold, for instance, never marked in Shufansky's range. This leopard immediately took to being photographed, and he was apt to leave a portfolio of profiles and full faces. The male Nezhinsky. He was the first leopard to land in a trap in 2002 at a time when researchers were still trying to figure out if the camera trapping methods for leopards would really work. From the start, this leopard's range was moderate in size and not the best of quality. Hunters from the Nizhinsky hunting lease frequently visit his range. The male Borisovsky. Initially, this male's range was entirely within the wildlife reserve bearing the same name. Ungulate numbers are high. Hunters are not allowed here. One thing for sure is that Borisovsky is lucky to have such a wonderful range. The female Tikhaya. She selected the most dangerous and least protected home range, close to a main road and near human settlements. She has to deal with people all the time. And these people's activities are not always noble. The site lacks the many inaccessible cliffs, deep caves, and other impenetrable corners where kittens can safely be protected and raised. The female Dalnea. Her range contains about as many humanly inaccessible cliffs, caves, and gullies as one could find anywhere in leopard land. So there is little disturbance. Tracks from males and tracks from kittens have been found in the snow. It's reasonable to believe that these are her offspring. By the winter of 2004, the male Nezhinsky throws a challenge to Shufansky. First, he boldly works a photo shoot with the camera traps in the female TK's range. And then he announces his claim to the female Dalnea. Borisovsky is also on the prowl and encroaches on Shufansky's range from a different angle, taking up some of the best range available to Leopold. The next winter brings even greater changes. Two new females immediately appear in the northern region. One of them takes a fence to the breaks between the Sandaga River and the Eldega River. The other sets up on a ridge between the two tributaries of the Eldegas. And here is where tracks of a female with kittens appear. It is not just females filling the leopard's ranks study of the photographs discovers a new male occupying available range in the headwaters of the Amber River. But the pleasant news is moderated with tragedy. The female Tikhaya was lost to a poacher's bullet in this same winter of 2004. Nezhinsky, along with Borisovsky, relentlessly worked Leopold's trails in search of females in 2005, squeezing the old guy towards the Griazne River and out of his traditional hunting grounds. He still retains some part of his former territory, but a new, unknown male invades. He gradually occupies the entire Amber watershed, 
all the way to the vicinity of the Zanadorovka, making a rush for the rights of the Gryazny River. Squeezed from all sides by young and emboldened competitors, the 16-year-old Leopold is left without a hunting area. Respect for greybeards has no place in Leopard's kingdom. Leopold is photographed for the last time. Then the female Dalnia disappears without a trace. Following her, the female from the Sandaga fails to make an appearance before the lens. All the males in the northern region are now left with but one female, one lone female leopard that we will call Eldega. At first glance, the abundance of suitors should make her happy. But in reality, the situation causes her nothing but trouble. The volume of ungulates on her, on her range is extremely limited. When males visit, they naturally scare off the wildlife. And when three males are moving about her hunting areas in search of happiness, her chances of a successful hunt are almost nil. And that means her kittens will remain hungry. During the winter of 2005, the camera traps clicked like crazy on the Nijinsky hunting territory. Researchers figure that either the number of leopards has doubled, or that something has been driving them about in contrast to the sedentary ways in past years. The film is scanned with great impatience to interpret the spot patterns and identify individuals. Six new unfamiliar leopards. The locations where these newcomers have been photographed afford no opportunity to comprehend the logic of their movements. The sense of it is that the, all five had just showed up at once in a new area, wandering around in search of happiness and treasure. But by 2006, only one of the 2005 newcomers is photographed. The other five have disappeared. Arrived from nowhere and disappeared into nowhere. Most likely, these were young animals who had, who had arrived in search of hunting grounds. Figuring out that housing was in short supply, they headed, they headed elsewhere to find happiness. We don't know if these guys came from the south or the north. We don't know where they came from, but perhaps we'll run into them again. Now let's look at how things are going in the central part of Leopard Range. Let me introduce you to an actor who has starred in five documentary films. Television viewers in England, Japan, Korea have admired the beauty and the healthy state of this animal. In the first year of the camera survey, this leopard was busy with shoots for his next film and barely had time to run over from his back lot to shoot a few photographs for science. Japanese filmmakers named this male Puzan, and the staff of the Kedrovia Pod Zapovednik call it Tolsti. Puzan has maintained his hunting territory for at least seven years. His territory stretches from the headwaters of the Paravashavka River to the Pishanya Peninsula. Kedrovia Pod Zapovednik makes up but a small portion of his range. He is a guest in an area where their mother of his children lives. His maid is no less famous in movie land. Filmmakers call her Skritna. She began filming as a six-month kitten, so we know her exact age. She was already nine years old when the camera traps began, and by that time she had already delivered three litters of kittens. Camera surveys also revealed a young male in the heart of Tolsti's territory. One can only guess as to how Tolsti put up with this boldness. The second female taking residency in the Zapovednik regularly leaves not only her tracks, but also tracks of small kittens. Skritni appeared only rarely in 2005, and no one has seen her since. By that time, Tolstoy had managed to run the young male out of his territory. The young male didn't disappear, but moved to the Narva River, where he resides with the surviving female. And this is the envy of Tolstoy. The male Filipovsky continues to find ways to expand his territory. Clearly uncomfortable working the same paths as the powerful Zanadorovsky, he wants to move farther away from the village of Filipovka, that is sadly famous for its poaching. He is trying to sit up on the Pishanya Peninsula. But here a meeting with Tolstoy awaits him. A meeting that does not promise anything good. All it takes is a duel of stairs and Filipovsky gives up the kill to the elder and without complaint. So let's sum up things. 
In five years of surveys, more than 20 leopards have become our friends. Twelve have disappeared without a trace, but this is not the status of the discoveries. Now there are only two females left among the leopards living in these two areas. Females for whom the males conduct a life and death battle. But this is not the saddest of the discoveries. What is saddest about this situation is that these beautiful and powerful animals, each fighting for its own life, have no way to collectively deal with the condition that the humans have placed them in. They can't unite to save their species. Each survives alone, shoving out competitors and dispiriting neighbors. A mechanism to select the most powerful is useful for a large, prospering population. For this fistful of leopards, it is leading to an internal calamity. They are no longer able to help themselves. Now only we, the people, have the capacity to save each of the survivors.